case of Kanika Jenkins is one of the most mind-bending cases you'll hear. Sleuths believe this video was doctored in order to remove another person, but what came out next is without a doubt terrifying. An autopsy found traces of a drug that is known to enhance the effects of alcohol basically rendering her incoherent. It also found that Kanika had severe brain swelling, which would not be caused by hypothermia. Still, the cops closed the case. Do you think Kanika's death was just an accident, or do you believe there's a big cover-up going on? Here's the update on this video. According to reports, the incident occurred on February 16th around 11.15 p.m. The Denver Police Department believes the man coerced the woman into his truck. Shortly after, she jumped out of the truck and tried hiding from the man. He found her and allegedly forced her back into his car. Then she escaped again. This time she was able to call authorities. Police arrested the man the following day. The woman is reportedly safe and the man is being held for numerous possible charges, including second degree kidnapping, criminal extortion, third degree assault, and violation of a protection order. Thank you to Bree who flagged this update. This student may never be released for her crimes. Okay, I'm going to, listen to me, I'm going to arrest you on suspicion of murder, okay, so you do not have to say... But she insists her boyfriend's death was a tragic accident. 23-year-old Alice Wood has been convicted of murdering Ryan Watson after a row at a party. They had an intense argument, and when they got home, Alice drove directly into him. But she didn't stop there. As Ryan tried to walk away, she hit him a second time, knocking him over the bonnet and under the car. That's when she drove off, dragging him 500 feet along the road. But Alice claims she didn't realise he was trapped underneath the car. She's due to be sentenced at the end of January. This is maybe the scariest urban legend I've ever heard, and it ended up being true. Back in the 1970s, there was this terrifying fun house in Long Beach, California called The Laugh in the Dark. And there was always this urban legend that all the mannequins inside were fake, except for one. Also, mind you, this is what this week's episode is about, so if you don't want spoilers, just listen to the episode. This urban legend came to be because there was one mannequin inside that just looked wrong. All the other ones looked fake, but this one in particular looked way too human. And a bunch of the kids also said the area that the mannequin was in just smelled really, really bad. So a few years go by and one day a film crew comes in and is using Laugh in the Dark for a film set. The director's lining up a shot and he just doesn't like the way this one mannequin looks in frame. So he goes over to a crew member and he's like, hey, can you just move this out of the shot? So the crew member goes over and starts moving the mannequin when its arm pops off. And inside of the mannequin's arm is human bone. The kids had been totally right. The mannequin was a mummified body. There's so much more to this story, like who the person was and how they got there. And I talk about the whole thing this week on the episode. Let's talk about one of the scariest photos ever taken, the Samantha Koenig photo. I have been terrified of this picture for years. And if you don't know why this picture is horrifying, let me explain why. So on February 1st, 2012, 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was working her barista job in Anchorage, Alaska, when suddenly a man named Israel Keys enters her job and kidnaps her. He then proceeds to do vile things to her and then unalives her. After this, while the city and her family are looking for her, Israel goes on a cruise and comes back to the news that they're looking for her. So what he does is he goes back, grabs her body, props her up, duct tapes her mouth, braids her hair, and sews her eyes open, and then proceeds to take this picture. And then sends this picture to Samantha's family and asks for $30,000. This, of course, was all in an effort to make it seem like she was still alive and to basically be given all that money. However, he would later be caught in Texas and then ended himself awaiting trial on December 2nd of that year. Now, the effort that he made to make her look alive in his ransom picture, to me, is absolutely horrifying. Now, I do want to state that this is an FBI recreation of the picture. However, that picture is somewhere locked away, never to be seen by the public, which I am so glad that Samantha and her family at least have that sort of privacy in this. But yeah, that to me is the scariest picture to ever exist. And to the people that worked on this case, yeah, keep that picture locked up. Okay, that's... I'm glad you are. I'm glad you are. This video shows the moment singer Chilino Sanchez found out he was going to die. Chilino was known for pioneering a Mexican genre of music called Narco Corrido, which uses dance music similar to polka, but with a focus on drug smuggling. Many local inmates had stories they wanted to preserve in the form of a ballad, so Chilino wrote about a lot of real people and real crimes. He himself supposedly took a life before fleeing to LA. Some of his customers would even gift him weapons and other presents. Because of his line of work, he made many enemies. 
In January 1992, a man jumped on stage while he was performing and shot at him four times, though only one shot hit him and he survived. A few months later, things seemed to be turning around for him as he was invited to play a few shows in Kuliakin. Some close to the singer warned him that this was a trap, but he went anyway, and on May 15th, he was performing at Salon Bougainvilliers when this video was recorded. Cellino was handed a note which supposedly was a death threat. He can be seen crumpling up the note and continuing to sing before the performance cuts off. After the performance, he and two of his brothers drove away from the venue before they were stopped by a group of armed men with state police IDs who claimed their commandant wanted to see him. Cellino got in one of their cars. The next morning, his deceased body was found blindfolded and with rope burns on the side of Highway 15. To this day, his attackers have not been identified. So this TikToker out of Tokyo, her name is Yuka. She had been dating a guy by the name of Phoenix Luna. And while everything seemed to be perfect in the beginning, not too long after they moved in together, she ultimately became suspicious of Luna. He had been getting home later and later and spending a lot more time on his phone than usual. So one night, just after Luna fell asleep, she ended up going through it, where she would find a photo of him being intimate with another woman. Then it happened. Yuka grabbed a knife, walked back on over to Luna, and straight up plunged it into his abdomen as hard as she possibly could. Immediately, Phoenix rose up from the couch, shoved the TikToker aside, and bolted out the apartment, heading straight for the elevator. But before Dude Man could even make it, his adrenaline completely wore off. Yuka rolled up on him again as he lay there pleading for his life. Then in a strange twist of fate, Yuka threw him into the elevator, took him downstairs, and just straight up sat there waiting on police to arrive. And it was there a series of now viral photos would be taken of Yuka, dubbed Yandere in real life. This video not indicative of all TikTokers from putting these situations, but we here at Slammer, I believe this to be about 30% based on non-factual data during uncontrolled mindless scroll. A child who was missing since 2019 has been found alive under a staircase. Four-year-old Paisley Schultes was removed from custody of her biological parents along with her sister. Although it's not been revealed as to why, her parents Kim Cooper and Kirk Schultes were no longer legally allowed to look after the girls. In July 2019, Paisley vanished from her family home while her older sister was at school. She'd been living near Ithaca, New York. Although police strongly suspected her biological parents, they had absolutely no proof. Police were actually able to search the parents' property. They denied having anything to do with this and the police could not find the girl inside the house. Years later, however, in 2022, police received a tip-off that the little girl may be in the house after all. Although at first it seemed that nothing was off about the property, after about an hour, one of the detectives realized something odd about the stairs. Acting on gut instinct, they looked a little closer and eventually found a small hiding place. When they were able to get a little closer, they found Paisley hiding in the small space. The couple were charged with custodial interference and endangering the welfare of a child. This might be the most brutal way somebody has ever died and whatever you do, don't look up the picture. Octavio de Silva was a 20-year-old soccer referee in Brazil and on June 30th, 2013, he was refereeing a soccer game when he sent off a player named Josmir Santos Abreu who was 31 years old. He refused to leave the field and began a fight with the referee. Abreu threw a punch which made Octavio draw a knife from his pocket and repeatedly stab Abreu. Abreu died on the way to the hospital and when fans watching the game, including Abreu's family and friends, found out about his death, they invaded the field and stoned Octavio before decapitating him and then ripping his limbs from his body with just their strength and no weapons, and then put his head on a stick in the middle of the field. And what makes this worse is that a graphic video surfaced online shortly after the incident, showing medical personnel reassembling Octavio's body. The video and pictures are extremely disturbing and I don't recommend looking them up. The way his limbs looked after being ripped off is extremely unsettling to look at, because you see strings of flesh, tissue, and bone because it wasn't cut off properly and it was just ripped off. This case is absolutely awful, but why did Octavio pull out a knife when somebody just punched him? If he didn't stab Hosmir or Breu to death, he would still be alive today. But just imagine being literally ripped limb from limb by an angry group of soccer fans, and there's nothing you can do as they pull your body apart. If you still use one of these things, you might want to take caution. In the mid-80s, 17-year-old Jason Finley was found deceased in his bedroom with zero evidence as to what happened. 
Jason was in good health and there was no evidence in his room that would suggest there was any kind of foul play that night. It wasn't until an autopsy revealed blood in Jason's inner ear, which points to an electrical surge of some kind. And that's when the pieces of this puzzle finally started to come together. Jason happened to be on the phone while there was a bad thunderstorm that night. And all it took was for his house to be struck by lightning and that electricity to travel through his telephone wires. The girl that Jason was on the phone with also admitted to hearing a weird clicking noise, a gasp from Jason, and then silence. Which that kind of makes sense. When I was a teenager, I remember thinking that this was a complete myth, but it's not. It actually has happened and claimed several lives. But thankfully, that risk has greatly reduced due to less and less people using these kinds of phones. Unless you're a cell phone user that decides to use your phone while it's charging during a power surge. This is the Hello Kitty murder case, and it's one of the most gruesome true crime stories you may ever hear about. This happened in 1999, and Fan here was abducted by three men and a girl. Fan Man Yu was then held inside of a flat that one of the killers rented out for about a month. She was tortured and beaten, and they even tried to pimp her out. And apparently, she was hung up and used as a punching bag. They even went as far as burning up her legs so that she couldn't even walk. She also had no real food to eat. They forced her to eat human feces. After that immense stress her body went through, she died after a little over a month being held captive there. This is where things get even crazier. They cut up her body, dismembered her completely, and then cooked up her head. They then stuffed her half-cooked head into a Hello Kitty mermaid doll. Investigators found this and found many insects inside of it as well. The rest of her dismembered body was discarded somewhere. The only pieces of evidence the investigators found was the skull inside of the Hello Kitty doll, some teeth on the ground, and organs in the freezer. Reading this story makes me just feel so horrible for Fan Man Yi and the torture she went through. This is definitely the worst true crime case I've ever read about. And then there are just so many more details I can't even say. Let me know what you guys think about this case in the comment section below. And as always, these videos are for informational purposes only. This is by far the craziest video of 2024. This is a video that has gone viral in the past couple days in which a father or mother's boyfriend is threatening the son to shoot him and he does. The video opens up with the father or boyfriend pointing the gun at the son. He can be heard saying, I'm going to blow his effing brains out right now. The mother then comes over and pulls the father away, screaming, no, no, stop. The father then walks away and the son then says, blow my brains out. The father then comes back into the room screaming, you want me to, while pointing the gun at him. The son flinches at this point and turns away and says, shoot me, I dare you. I guarantee you go to jail for life. The mother then shuts the door and you hear the father saying, I'm getting ready to blow his brains out and yours. I'm sick of this to the mother. The son then gets up and opens the door. He then says, you're going to blow my mom's brains out. The father then points the gun back at the son and fires. Everything goes silent as you hear the mom gasp. The camera then faces the floor and you hear the mom repeating, did he hit you? Did he hit you? And at this point, you see blood droplets hitting the floor. Once this happened, the mom screams, Oh my god, you're going to jail. The son then runs out of the house and shuts the door. The video then ends. Luckily, the bullet only grazed the son's ear and he survived, and the father or mother's boyfriend then went into the backyard and ended his own life. Probably because he thought he killed the son with that shot. I don't know what caused this whole situation, but it had to be brewing for some time for the man to snap like this. You can find the video on Twitter, and it has over 25 million views in just a couple of days. This video is chilling because just 15 minutes after this little girl posted this TikTok, her life was senselessly taken. On February 17th, 2021, a nine-year-old girl named Felicia Konoshuk, who lived in the Russian city of Chita, posted a video to her TikTok claiming that her neighbor had been pounding on her door for over an hour. Here is the transcript of her TikToks. Pause to read. And it started after Felicia's father left her and her brother alone to go to the store. Eventually, the neighbor stopped knocking, and Felicia chatted with her friend about the TikTok video that she'd posted, and her friend invited her to meet her at the park to take her mind off of things. Fifteen minutes after Felicia posted the video, she heard a soft knocking on the door, so she went to answer it, thinking it was her friend or her father. Before she could answer the door, the neighbor opened fire and took Felicia's life. 
Her father returned moments later to find her, and she took her last breath in his arms. The neighbor was 33-year-old Vasily Dunay, who had been getting increasingly more aggravated over the sound of some home repairs Felicia's father had been doing. He was also extremely drunk at the time. He pled guilty to the crime and was given a 17-year sentence to be served in a penal colony in Siberia. Vasily was fully aware that there were children in the home, so do you think 17 years is long enough for something that reckless? Sometimes true for strange and fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders, gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminated in acts of cannibalism. The man in this photo is one of the worst sexual offenders in the history of Ohio. This man's name was Brian Peppers. For years, this photograph circulated on the internet attached to his story of sexual abuse, and nobody believed that it was real. But some fact-checking was eventually done, and yes, Brian Peppers was a real man with a real peppered past. So, Brian was born with something called Cruzon Syndrome. And when Brian was younger, he was bullied incessantly by people in his school. So, as Brian grew older over the years, his body quickly began to grow weaker, and eventually his mental health deteriorated to such a point that he had to be checked into a nursing home. But it was in the year 1998 when Brian was arrested and convicted of molesting somebody. According to the report, he actually sexually abused the nurse that was taking care of him in the nursing home. Brian was then removed from the nursing home, he spent 30 days in jail, and he was on probation for five years. After this incident, Brian was on the sex offenders registry in Ohio up until his death. When he died, Brian Peppers was only four foot one inches tall, and he passed away on February 7th, 2012, which, eerily enough, is the day that I'm posting this TikTok, and I didn't even realize it until I read that just now. Guess out. I'm gonna give you guys a little bonus. All right, that's about as raunchy as I'm gonna get. What the hell is that? Missing Florida woman was just found locked inside of a shipping container nearly 72 hours after she disappeared. And what she has to say about it is bizarre. So what happened? I don't know. I was in one place and I found in another. So this is 52-year-old Marlene Lopez, and she was last seen at her home on Lucerne Drive in Cocoa, Florida this past Monday. She wasn't officially reported missing until Wednesday, though, and that's because one of her co-workers became concerned after Marlene failed to pick up her son. The Cocoa Police Department began to search every location that Marlene was known to frequent, but they came up empty-handed. That is until yesterday when someone heard banging and screaming coming from a shipping container next to a business on 2005 North Cocoa Boulevard. When the person managed to get into the container, they found Marlene. She 
She was uninjured but dehydrated, which I 100% believe considering Florida is so humid and hot. According to police, Marlene wasn't in a good state of mind when she was found, but she said that she was in one place and found in another. The man who owns the shipping container, his name is Troy, and he says that the container is stocked with lawnmowers. He said that he first saw Marlene walking around the area Monday evening, and as part of his routine, he ended up locking the shipping container on Tuesday. Troy said that he didn't hear anything inside that night or on Wednesday, and he believes that Marlene walked inside of the container on her own and passed out. He reportedly found a lighter and a pipe inside after she was rescued. One thing that he does want to make clear is that he is not to blame for Marlene getting trapped, and he says that he's even considering pressing charges against her. According to the Coco police, it appears that Troy just locked the shipping container up for the night, not realizing that anyone was inside of it, but they are still investigating the circumstances surrounding the incident. Topic of polygamy is big in the black community. What the f is going on in my building? Uh uh. Why does it sound like gunshots in the f building? King, go in the room. In November of 2017, this woman, Tamika Baxter, was live streaming on Facebook. It was about 2.30 in the morning she was talking to some people on live when she heard what sounded like gunshots echoing from the hallway in her apartment complex. In the rest of the video, which I'm going to show at the end of this TikTok, she went to investigate the scene and saw a man lying on the ground and heard a woman screaming for help and to dial 911. As it turns out, the victim that evening who did indeed die was 18-year-old Jashin Patton. Jashin was a promising athlete from the Philadelphia area. He had really great sports stats, he was a rising star, and after his death, people claimed that he just had that it factor. He was going to be somebody big. But on that evening, Jashin had just found out that he was getting accepted into a good college, and his relative, his relative's boyfriend, and another woman were celebrating in their apartment with beer. There were also two young children in the apartment when all of this went down. At one point in the evening, though, tensions began to rise in the apartment, and like I said, at around 2.30 a.m., gunshots rang out. Those gunshots were fired by this man, 30-year-old Derek L. Butler, who was later arrested for the murder of Jashin Patton. Eventually, Derek was arrested, like I said before, he had initially fled the scene and he was actually on the run for a while, but at one point in 2019, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison, possibly more for the murder of Jashin. So I'm going to play you the clip from the rest of this live stream now. It's pretty disturbing, so I'm going to warn you in advance. Come here, go in the room. Please, please, go in the room. Please. What the f was that? Yo! Is my neighbors fighting? It sounded like gunshots in my building. That's my neighbors, y'all. I think the music is up and I think they're fighting. Oh my God, they're fighting in there. Should I knock on the door? Oh my God, they're fighting. Oh my God, they're fighting. Call 911. Call 911. He's saying call 911. We need to talk about the infamous Russian pedophile and snuff film ring. So just so I'm factually correct, here's the article I'm talking about here. So in the year 2000, a massive scandal rocked Russia. In that year, Russian authorities uncovered a pedophile ring that ran all the way from Russia to the United States. There were over 5,000 members that were busted in different countries, but the exact details of these crimes are really hard to stomach, so viewer discretion is advised. Obviously, the police and authorities had to watch some of this content that was uncovered, and what they saw was absolutely disturbing. They saw hundreds of different children being abused by groups of men, and on top of that, after the abuse was over, these children were then brutally tortured and killed on camera. Now, something extremely disturbing is that these videos made over $470 million worth of revenue. Just stop and think about that for one second. Just stop and think about how much money that is that people were paying to watch these videos. There were people in the U.S. purchasing these tapes. There were people in the Middle East, people in Russia, people in Italy. 
And in fact, when they were covering this news story, two European TV stations accidentally broadcast images and video from the tapes. Graphic, uncensored material. Obviously, the whole team that was involved in that was fired. But the police officers and authorities who actually worked on this case have gone on the record and said every single night since then, they still hear children screaming in their dreams. So these rings operated throughout many different countries, including Italy, Russia, all throughout the Middle East. And what the authorities think they were doing was snatching children out of orphanages and even at times targeting kids when they walked away from their parents at the circus. Now, thankfully, hundreds of people were arrested after this was uncovered and justice was dealt. And thankfully, Russian's prison system is pretty brutal, so I'm sure that the men who were put in there for these crimes got the justice that they deserved. But this is absolutely frightening because this stuff is still happening today in 2024. It's not just happening in Europe, it's happening in America. There is so, so much more we could get into here. But yeah, we need to continue to talk about this stuff to raise awareness that this is happening. This is one of the worst cases in human history. This is the murder of Christine Silouan. She was from the Philippines and was a volunteer in church and she used the church every day from 4 to 6 p.m. On the day of her murder, she went to church as per her schedule, but she didn't come home after that. Her parents then started to worry and they began searching for her with their neighbors. And what they found is absolutely horrid. They found her body in a farm where half her face was sliced like a piece of pizza and her face was literally skinned down to her skull. Also, her brain was completely destroyed by acid. The police then started investigating and they checked the cameras and found out that she was with a guy. The people started protesting about this case and the case was then given to special officers. They had a lot of pressure on this. A week before this happened, she broke up with her boyfriend so the police took him into custody and he was proving that he was at home all day when she was murdered but officers were completely tired of this case and they then sentenced him as the murderer. But after a few months, a thief was caught in a store where he confessed that he murdered and raped Christine. He said he started talking to her on Facebook with a fake account and was using fake photos of another guy that was pretty good looking. Christine fell for the guy and she assumed that he was about 20 years old and they started texting daily. One day they both decided to meet up at 6pm near the church she went to. But upon arriving, Christine noticed that this was not the guy she was talking to and he was around 40-ish years old. She then refused to talk to him and tried to go back, but he held her hands extremely forcefully. He then took her far away from town and raped her repeatedly and put iron rods inside her personal organs. He then cut her face in half and then skinned her whole head down to the skull. And to make it even worse, he put acid inside of her head. The autopsy also revealed that her tongue, trachea, esophagus, parts of her neck, and her right ear were missing. The self-proclaimed killer of this case named Renato Lanis said that he used barber-type scissors and stabbed her 30 times on different parts of her body and skinned her face. Christine Silouan was only 16 years old and this case is extremely haunting. There's a picture of her body that was found in the field, but Google did a really good job of not showing it and hiding it. So even if you do go looking for the picture, I don't think you're going to find it. This is one of those cases that after you get done reading it, you just feel some sort of uneasiness. I feel so bad for Christine's family and I can't imagine finding my daughter in this state. May Christine Silouan rest in peace. This man is one of the worst serial killers in US history and a lot of people don't know about him. This is the story of Dean Coral, also known as the Candyman or the Pied Piper. So Dean Quarrel was described as a shy, serious kid who was kind of a loner. His parents had remarried and divorced twice. Um, his mother eventually got remarried and moved the family to Texas. So I did mention that he goes by two different nicknames, and we are going to talk about both of them, but let's start with the first one, which is the Candyman. Now he earned that nickname because when his family moved back to Texas, they opened up a candy company. Dean Quarrel eventually made his way to become the vice president of the candy company, and he earned a reputation of being really kind to the local children, particularly the teenage boys. Like he put a pool table in the back of his factory so that the local kids could hang out. And he was known to give out lots of free candy. So they called Dean Quarrel the Candy Man. 
He did make a couple of inappropriate advances to some of the younger staff at his company, but if they complained, he would just fire them. Then in 1967, Dean Coral met someone who is incredibly important to this story because they alter the course of each other's lives forever. In 1967, Dean Coral met David Owen Brooks, who was only 12 years old at the time. David was only in sixth grade when they met, and he was in a vulnerable position to be taken advantage of. His parents were divorced, he didn't have a lot of money, and he got made fun of all the time for the way he looked and because he wore glasses. But he started to hang out at the pool table behind Dean Coral's factory. Dean Coral gave him free candy. He gave him money if he needed it. And David said that Dean Coral was one of the first adults he had met who didn't make fun of the way he looked and he came to view Dean Coral as a father figure in his life. He didn't know he made friends with a psychopath, though, because this is what Dean Coral was doing. Because Dean Coral exploited his trust and convinced him to let him essay him in exchange for money, which totally mind-fucked him, because he eventually dropped out of high school and came to regard Dean Coral's apartment as his second home. And he, unfortunately, always felt a deep sense of loyalty to Dean Coral. Which is so sad, because he is one of those special kind of monsters that turns their victims into victimizers. However, according to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, like I've known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer, and cannibal. This is said to be one of the worst cartel videos ever, so whatever you do, don't look up the video. Before I begin, I can't stress enough how bad this video is. Whatever you do, never go searching for it. The full version of the video is 6 minutes long, and the video is shot in the nighttime in some sort of desert location. You see the victim who has been blindfolded with his hands tied behind his back, and he is also wearing a white t-shirt that spells out the cartel he belongs to. The scene seems to be lit up by the car lights and the victim is surrounded by multiple heavily armed cartel members. They are wearing all black tactical gear and carrying high grade weapons. One of the cartel members then begins to read a statement and as he's doing this the cameraman starts to move closer to the victim. After the statement is finished the victim is forced to the ground face down in the dirt. Multiple cartel members hold him down by stepping on his back and pulling back his arms. The victim has been completely immobilized so they can carry out this awful act of violence. The victim doesn't make a sound as he awaits what's about to happen to him. After the victim has been restrained and pinned down, a cartel member carrying some kind of large knife slices a vertical cut on the back of the victim's head. He does this as a starting point to flay and scalp the victim as he is still alive. After the cut, blood starts to puddle on the dirt floor, and using the initial cut, the cartel member slices under the victim's scalp and starts to remove it from the skull. As he cuts, he pulls the skin back to ease the blade cutting underneath the scalp. After a few seconds, the back of the victim's head has been completely scalped. However, the cartel member makes sure not to cut the skin off in chunks and instead attempts to complete the scalping and flaying in one clean go. After the skin on the back of the victim's head has been severed, the cartel member then moves to removing the skin and hair from the sides of the victim's head. While doing this, he also cuts off the victim's ears. The back of the victim's skull looks like a red ball with shades of white from the victim's skull also showing. The top of the victim's head is then scalped. The victim is still alive, but somehow has yet to make a sound. Not even one scream. The victim is then turned over on his back, and as this is happening, a cartel member puts his boot on his chest to stop him from moving, and at this point, the victim, who is still conscious, says his first words. And despite the awful and intense pain he must have been going through, he tells the cartel member to simply stop stepping on his chest in a very calm manner. But as he's lying on his back, a cartel member then flays the skin off of his face. He pulls the skin that has already been flayed and starts to cut down from the victim's forehead. And as the blade slices under the skin, you hear a tearing type sound, which is just awful. After about 20 seconds, the cartel member completes the flaying, but he realizes he missed a few pieces of skin on the victim's cheek. He then goes back and cuts the remaining skin off. The victim also has his nose cut off, and what is left of the victim is a horrific sight. His head looks like a red skull, and due to the lack of skin, it makes his teeth and eyes way more prominent. 
The detached scalp and face is then placed on the victim's chest and the cartel member then finishes off the victim by cutting deep into his throat and it appears to finally kill the victim. The cartel member then cuts off his tongue and takes off his shirt. He then plunges the knife deep into the victim's chest and cuts vertically, exposing all of his organs. The victim at this point has lost so much blood that it doesn't even cause bleeding. The cartel member then reaches into the victim's chest and cuts out his heart. The heart is still beating and he then holds it up to the camera. The cartel member then kneels down next to the deceased victim as the camera focuses on the still beating heart. The last two minutes of the video is the cartel member still holding the beating heart in complete silence. Nobody talks and all you hear is the wind blowing until the heart stops beating and the video concludes. Whatever you do, please don't go searching for this video. Just when you think you've seen it all, a video like this surfaces. I can't stress enough how bad this video actually is. It's just crazy knowing that this is happening in real time to real people and it's just awful knowing that stuff like this happens on a daily basis.